Rising. In the ground floor flat of a half-built block in northern Ethiopia, a young woman, Zephyr Sultan, is sat on the floor of her living room having her hair made up. Thin, delicate braids line the sides of her head, with a single thick one running down the middle. In her arms, a baby is sleeping. Our son's baptism is on Saturday, and I'm getting my hair done before it. This kind of small braid down the side is called gamme, and the stick hair on the top is called albaso. It is a traditional hairstyle that is good for a baptism ceremony. While her hair is being braided, they're watching her wedding video from a year ago on a TV in the corner of the room. We met three years ago. I was studying accounting and he was studying management. We were very happy, so we discussed it with our parents and decided to get married. Our wedding was really good because our brothers and sisters from both Eritrea and Ethiopia attended the ceremony, which made us very happy. And I guess you're hoping that that can be repeated for the, for the baptism of your first child as well. Our wedding was very great, and now I hope our son's baptism will be even better. I hope lots of family from Eritrea and Ethiopia will come. Just two years ago, her relatives from Eritrea wouldn't have been able to come for either a wedding or a baptism. For almost 20 years following a brutal war between the two countries, the border between Ethiopia and Eritrea was completely closed, with a heavy military presence and movement across it forbidden. But in September 2018, things began to change. A new peace deal was agreed, the troops started to pull back and the border opened up once again. For the families and communities living on either side, they've had the opportunity to reconnect, rebuild and move on with their lives. I'm Rob Wilson and over the next hour on the BBC World Service, I'll take you to the border town of Zalambessa to see how lives are changing in all kinds of ways. This is Ethiopia and Eritrea, Rebirth at the Border. It's part of the Life Changes series from the BBC, a collection of stories about moments that can change lives. Perspectives on how people are responding to an ever-changing world. When the checkpoints between Ethiopia and Eritrea opened for the first time in 20 years, thousands turned out at official ceremonies held along the border and thousands more rushed over in both directions to see friends and family they hadn't met with for years. Zarai Gebrehuet is the husband of Zephyr, getting ready for the baptism. I could not control my tears. It felt like I was born again because the people of Eritrea and Ethiopia, especially here in the Tigray region, share a common language and culture. We have so much in common. And also I was excited to meet relatives. And then I felt really great on my wedding day because the peace agreement with Eritrea meant my family members were able to come from there for my wedding. I was extremely happy and overwhelmed with joy. One of the biggest events was in Zalambessa, situated right on the border on the Ethiopian side, with a main road running through it leading to the official checkpoint on the edge of town. A year and a half on, this is where the preparations for the baptism were in full swing when I visited Zarai's family home. The ceremony is an integral part of the area's biggest religion, Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity. For devout followers, this touches on many aspects of life. For instance, they refrain from eating meat and dairy every Wednesday and Friday. And the party after the baptism is always a large and lively gathering of family and friends. Alongside weddings and funerals, these events have huge social significance. Here's Zarai again. The people seek love and peace. They want to be together at weddings, baptisms, funerals and memorials. They want to mark these sorts of days together. On occasions like a wedding and a baptism, 
families give their sons and daughters to one another in marriage, according to tradition. They marry one another and the families grow. I'm just with Zarai's brother, yeah. and he's in charge of the meat. What are you cooking? What are you making? Oh, I'm uh, cutting this meat. And you are cooking your, yourself? You are uh, good. He's just looked at Zarai and told him that he has to cook it himself. But there is a huge bowl of raw meat ready for roasting, and through the doorway as well, there's basically half a carcass of an ox. It's an ox or what? Oxen, oxen. What? It's, it's oxen? Yeah. Small oxen, not uh, old. Young. Young. One whole oxen? Yeah, oxen. <laughs> Are the young ones the best? Young is the best, yeah. When if the old, the meat is not good. So but young is good. We'll rejoin the preparations later on. But while these sorts of family gatherings have found a new lease of life since the fanfare of the opening ceremonies, the precise status of the border changed again just a few months later. In late December 2018, news began to emerge that some of the official border checkpoints, including the checkpoint in Zalambessa, were closed again. No official reasons were given, and this situation continues. But the border itself is no longer heavily militarised and patrolled as it was before, so people living in the area can still move back and forth informally, on foot. You can't drive across through the official checkpoint, but you can walk across around the outside. I caught a glimpse of this when I first arrived in the town. We've just been up at the official border crossing point in Zalambessa. It's currently closed, but the soldiers there were very friendly. And just as we were leaving, we met two women who had been at a funeral in Ethiopia. They'd come over from Eritrea for the day, and they were just walking back in plain sight of the soldiers just around the side of the border crossing, but in plain sight of the soldiers there. And in fact, even one of the soldiers came over to give one of the women directions about how to get back to Eritrea even quicker than the route that they were currently taking. So it just shows, although the border is officially closed, there is still some movement across. This is a fundamental change from the 20-year period where if you were caught trying to cross the border, you could be arrested or at worst shot dead. But as we'll see, the closure of the official checkpoints is a source of frustration for many. One of the most visible changes in Zalambessa since the 2018 peace deal is at the weekly market where Zarai's family bought the provisions ready for the baptism party. BBC Tigrinya's regional reporter, Germay Gebru, showed me around. It's Saturday morning and we're in a big square in the middle of town and it's market day. This is where every week people come to sell goods and, um, and it's filling up pretty fast, Germay, from the time that we got here early in the morning. What sort of things are, are people selling here? What sort of things can you see around you? Most of them are foodstuffs, tomatoes, potato, the onion and the carrots. And then there's these nice big green chilies that people eat just raw, don't they? They eat them with food. Yeah, this is a very common one, and uh, we can see the dry one also. Yeah, there's a huge sack of dried red chilies, and this is what they use to make the chilli that goes in the local sauces and also some powder that you can dip your food and your meat in when you're eating as well, right? It's called... Mitmita. Mitmita. Yeah, it's very hot. Hot, spicy. It's good with cooked meat. So, uh, as we can see, that people from both countries are now gathering for a market. And so, Eritreans now, since the border opening in 2018, are actually coming to the market every Saturday to buy goods here in Zalambessa. Yeah, many people here, those who are buying, are Eritreans. They came across the border from those uh, villages. They can come across the border. They can pass easily. And that's led to a big expansion in how big this market is in the last couple of years, right? Yeah, it was not like this before two years. It's now because people came across the border from Eritrea, the market has became greater and greater. Here is a, um, a woman selling onion, tomato and potatoes. 
And she's also got a big sack of dried leaves. What yeah, are the dried is, leaves? We call it, uh, this is a, we call it geisho, this plant that helps us to make the suwa. You have already tested it, suwa, the local beer. Oh, fantastic. All right, well, this is my favourite yeah. bag then. Many simple, simple, simple. Bernesh Abbay is a fancy Her name is Bernesh Abbay. So can she tell us how this market has changed in the last couple of years since the peace deal? Bernesh is a salam in Arkham. It's a very good thing. 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 The market is getting bigger and bigger. And also she said that this is a place of, a kind of a contact place for both people from Eritrea and Ethiopia. And the people are reunited here in the market, she said. Not only our families and relatives, we have also created a bond of relationship with our customers from Eritrea. And what's that meant for her business? Bernesh has said that uh, it's better than before. But uh, she said that we can't say it's best because the number of customers from Eritrea is not as it was at the time of the peace agreement. When the checkpoint was open for about four months. Yes, but now the checkpoint is closed. People are using those villages just to come. So she said that it's not as we want it. And presumably that means that people, when they come, they have to come on foot rather than if the checkpoint itself was open, they could come in a vehicle and buy lots of goods and take them back. They are hiding to go and to come. They can't carry many goods. Okay. Thank you very much, Yanili. Thank you. With prices of some foodstuffs up to four times cheaper in Ethiopia, it's no wonder Eritreans from across the border want to come and shop here. Before the war, Zalambesa was an important trade hub for local communities on both sides. But the border closure meant Eritreans had to find new places to buy goods. And this meant travelling longer distances, as I was told, by a young Eritrean woman standing with a large wooden table tied to her back, ready to return home across the border. We came from the village of Debra Libanos and travelled almost three hours by foot. We came to shop here because there is a holiday coming up. There is no market near our village in Eritrea. So we came to Zalambesa. It's really good here. Now the market is closer than where we went before. In Eritrea, we used to travel five hours to get to a market. This is three hours away, so it's actually closer to us. The shopping went well. We could even carry more goods from here. As you drive north along the main road to Zalambesa, the vast and rocky landscape is awe-inspiring. But another thing that strikes you is the amount of construction work that's going on. When the border first opened a year and a half ago, people from all over the country were keen to start businesses along the road they expected to be a major trade route. Close to Salambesa, there's now a new petrol station, an unthinkable investment two years ago as it was the end of the line. That sense of optimism has made its mark. One of those who relocated to the region to invest is Fisai Hailu. Born in Eritrea, just across the border from Zalambesa, he left for Israel after being jailed as a political prisoner for 13 years. In 2012, he moved again to Ethiopia, where he was living in the capital Addis Ababa when he heard the news of the peace deal in 2018. It felt like things had brightened up overnight, and I didn't waste any time before buying a plot of land. Zalambasa is like a central meeting point, so I chose it because it keeps me close to the people who take part in my sorrows and my joy. It is a hub for all of us, and with those from where I was born and raised, where my siblings and relatives are. So I'm just at Fasaya's house, and he's going to show me the plans for his new hotel that's just under construction. They're just working on the foundations right now. But he's going to show me all the plans that he's got. Hello, Fasai. How are you? 
It's fine, and you? How are you? This is the master plan. It was drawn up by an architect. Okay, so we've got a large blue piece of paper that's being unfolded, and it's got some quite complicated architectural designs on that. I don't know what they mean. Here's one bit I can understand. It says first, second, third, and roof slab reinforcement detail. So that means it's got what? Ground floor plus three? Ground plus three. Ground plus three floors. It has a bar, restaurant, a lounge and reception area, and bedrooms. Every bedroom has a restroom and a shower. I wanted it to be fully equipped so then people will be attracted to stay there. Does it feel like a dream right now? Wow. I never thought that I would get to this point. I wasn't the only one in prison. It was like the whole family was imprisoned. When I was released, I went out of my country. Then I came to Ethiopia, and I'm striving with my work here. But God has been good to me. He has made this a reality. And finally, I'm able to see that the best is yet to come. I wish to see better things, not only for me, but for both people to have peace and live a happy life. And as for our leaders, they should forget about who the winner is and focus on how to feed the people. The winner is the one who creates development for his people. I wish they would develop this kind of mentality. May God help them. Because right now the border is actually closed, although there's some movement across it for some families. Does that frustrate you as a businessman and as someone who's building a hotel here where you thought there was going to be lots of traffic, lots of business, lots of movement around here? I work in hope. Nobody would invest in a frustrated situation. But my hope is the past will never repeat itself, even though some things are not clear like the situation with the border checkpoints opening and closing. It is just a temporary setback. I don't believe they will go back to the past, to war and conflict. I believe both people will not let their children go to war again. My hope is with peace. Finding paid employment can be difficult in Ethiopia, so many start their own businesses as a means of getting by. This is exactly what Fisaye did. After leaving Israel and settling in Addis Ababa, he used savings and help from his children to invest. So this is your truck. It's big and red. This is called Sino truck. It is made in China. I've owned this since I started doing business. There are many of them in Ethiopia. These are the best trucks out there for construction. They carry all kinds of materials, like metal bars, cement, rocks, sand, and construction material. So we're sat in the cab here. I can see there's a nice red and black pattern material with some yellow trim. All over the cab, there's stickers, religious stickers, stickers with pictures of Jesus, Mary, and also, quite ingeniously, the tax discs have been arranged on the windscreen in the shape of a cross. So why is there all the religious material in the truck? Is that for for good luck for the driver? Whenever we travel in a truck, it is with prayer. We remember all the saints. The driver put all those pictures of the saints in the truck. Having all the pictures of the saints is believed to help prevent an accident. It means praying for good things to happen. And do you think that one day if the border reopens, you might be able to use it to do business in Eritrea as well? I have the hope that if the border checkpoint opens again, I can go there for work, as it is my country. But not only me, I hope everyone will be able to travel back and forth, and for peace to return. That's all.
One of the contractors building for Sayed's hotel is Zurai, who we met earlier planning his son's baptism. We found the young father hard at work on site. Wow, well, Zurai, there's a lot happening here. There's about 10 guys all crowded around a cement mixer. They're mixing it with big pieces of gravel and then shoveling it onto trays and taking it and filling it in the foundations. Zurai, what's going on? We set off with the workers at 5 a.m. and the work is in progress. We are constructing the foundations carefully and it will be very strong. And it feels to me like there's a lot of this sort of activity, this sort of building happening in Zalambesa, in Fatsi, just down the road. Is that the way that you see it as well? Is there a lot happening currently? This is a sign of development in the country. But mostly the reason is the reopening of the border and the people's hope of making business. And just away from the construction, it's the baptism of your son the day after tomorrow. There's quite a lot of work to be doing. Do you not have lots of preparations for the baptism? Well, when I am here working on site, my parents and siblings are working on the preparations for the baptism. I'm following up from here by phone and doing what I can to help. Wow, OK, well, you're a busy man, so I'm going to let you get back to work. OK, OK, thank you. It's a little bit of an argument that's just broken out about when they need to break for lunch. Some of the guys think it's time already. And one of them has just been over to two huge jerry cans full of locally brewed beer, Sua, that they've got waiting for them to have with their lunch. He's filled the cup and he's taken it back over to the mixer to pass it around the lads. But the boss, he says, there's just a little bit more work to do before they can break for lunch. Right, it's time for lunch. Not only is Visaya's hotel an example of the optimism that many in the region hold on to, he wants to use it to make a statement. <laughs> The desire is there against all odds. The desire is to live in unison. Most importantly, we are there for each other, in good and bad times. After it is finished, the name of my hotel will be an expression of my desire for the two people to be together. I want you to tell the narrative that it belongs to both people. Therefore, I plan to name it the Two Brothers Hotel. It is to say we are brothers and we are inseparable. That's all from part one of Ethiopia and Eritrea, Rebirth at the Border, on the BBC World Service. I'm Rob Wilson, and in part two, I'll take you to Zarai and Zephyr's baptism celebrations, and we'll find out whether their relatives did manage to join them from across the border in Eritrea. The documentary is just one of our BBC World Service podcasts. There are many others to choose from. Coronavirus, self-isolation, extreme measures, still the disease spreads. As the coronavirus story develops, we're bringing you the very latest. Many governments have announced new measures to try to contain the virus. A daily roundup of news, information and health advice. We are in new territory. And reports from affected areas. There's been confusion all day here. The Coronavirus Global Update from the BBC World Service. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Now, let's return to the documentary. Welcome back to Ethiopia and Eritrea, Rebirth at the Border, from the BBC World Service. I'm Rob Wilson, and I'm following the baptism into Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity of a new baby boy. Born in the northern Tigray region of Ethiopia, where family ties spanning the border with Eritrea have been rekindled since a peace deal in 2018. For 20 years, the border was locked down, and the communities on either side separated. And while the official checkpoints remain closed, the demilitarisation of the border region is allowing movement between the two countries in ways unimaginable just two years ago. We'll pick up the story in Adigrat, a city close to the border. We're just catching up with Zafar and Zarai on the afternoon before the baptism before they leave for the family home at Zalambesa and where the church is. And there's just one more important thing for them to do before they go. Hey, 
Now we are going to the traditional dress shop to get the clothes we ordered from the tailor. After picking them up, we will go to the bus station. And then departing from Adigrat, we will go to the town of Zalambasa. Zephyr, this is the main city in the region going up to the border with Eritrea. Would you say there's been changes here in the city of Adigrat since the peace deal? Yes, there have been a lot of changes. The number of victims has increased a lot from before. The population is also increasing, and there is more work too. There is a lot of change. Oh, we've just walked into a beautiful shop. All around the walls, there are mannequins with white dresses on them with all kinds of coloured embroidery around the bottom and down the front. There's red, pink, lots of gold. And all along the back, there they have the shawls arranged by their patterns, clean white, mixed with bright, beautiful colours. This one is mine, and this one is my wife's, with the hair scarf called Natsala. I'm very happy with the work she's done and its quality. It's really nice. I always order at Birhan's because she works with care. I'm going to leave them to the final preparations now. They've got quite a lot to do before they get up and they have to be at the church at 3 a.m. tomorrow morning in the dark. They'll start the baptism and it will go on until the sun rises. So we'll meet them there. The communities on either side of the border have long been closely intertwined. Eritrea and Ethiopia were joined in a federation until 1993 when Eritrea gained official independence after a long armed struggle and then a referendum. And even after that, movement across the border was virtually unregulated up to when war broke out in 1998. I wanted to hear the perspective of an older generation, those who can really remember what life was like before the war. So I sat down with Zarai's parents, Leta Brahan and Gebrehuet, and we started with what cross-border ties were like back then. We had a very good relationship. We had love and peace and a lot of social interaction. The market there was here with us and we used to visit each other on holidays and celebrate religious festivals together. Sat on striking pink living room chairs, they told me how their immediate family was also split in two when war broke out. Three of their children who were away studying at the time stayed in Ethiopia. But as Eritrean soldiers took control of Zalambesa, Letabrahan and Gebrehuet were taken across the border with their other five children and stayed in Eritrea for the duration of the conflict. <laughs> By God's help, we were able to see it through. We were crying. We were not able to live in past the border. The government gave us tents to live in, but we couldn't find water to drink. We were forced to drink dirty water that smith bad, and then we got sick when we drank it. We had no choice, but a lot of people died because of this. Gebrehuet, what was it like for you then when the war did finally end and you were able to t- return to Zalambesa and be reunited with your family and get on with your life? We came back in peace and we got to see our children in Adgrat. Everyone welcomed us. Then they cleared the landmines and we finally managed to return to our village. The next 18 years became known as no peace, no war. The fighting ceased, but tensions remained, and the border was impenetrable. Even phone communication between the two countries was blocked, so news of the peace agreement in 2018 was received with joy in the borderlands. It was great, and we were excited when the border reopened. We finally got to see our brothers and sisters again. A lot of people crossed the border, but I was watching it from here on TV. I was afraid at first because I heard that they wouldn't allow people to cross. 
بتسفك شعبي حات البحر كنت هرات رب مزعول عم كنا زلطة. I traveled by car and went out to San Afe in Eritrea. I visited relatives and stayed there for a while. A lot of relatives also came here. We were so happy. We had missed each other so much. And there were tears of happiness when we saw each other. We kissed and hugged. And although the government hasn't fully opened the border, we continue to meet in peace. The people are mixed. We are mixed by blood. And the people never betrayed each other. Letta Brahan, when you look at the border, do you feel that you and your husband, Gebrehuet, as an older generation who have all of these memories, the experience of before the war, during the war, after the war, do you feel like you have a different perspective from, say, your children when you think about issues around the border? <laughs> We just wish that there will be peace and the border checkpoint will be opened so our children can work in peace. Our time has already passed. It doesn't matter how it was. We want our children to have peace and to work in peace. But we are denied to have peaceful relations because of both governments. We have seen four governments. We have had all the good and the bad, and we thank God that we had a good life. But we sent all our children to school, and only two of them have jobs. The situation in Ethiopia is unstable. We can't sleep in peace because the border checkpoints is still closed. We wish that our children are able to raise their children in peace. These are our prayers. We've heard how the weekly market is something that continues to bring people informally across the border on foot, despite the checkpoint closure. Another thing that draws people is their health and well-being. I'm just walking into the gravelled courtyard of Zalambessa Health Centre. It's the one clinic in the town. And there's a ring of fir trees around the outside, a big bush of bamboo in the middle. They provide fresh air and also a place for the birds to live, which you can hear in the background. It's a quiet and calm and clean space. And all morning there's been a steady stream of people walking in to see the doctors here. Before the peace deal, they would have all been Ethiopians from this town. But since the borders have relaxed, Eritreans have also been coming to get health services here. My name is Samrawit Burhane. I work as a health officer at Zalambesa Health Center, and I'm also the acting director. After the opening of the borders, more Eritreans than Ethiopians were coming here to receive services. This was beyond capacity and over the health station's budget. We offered services with whatever we had, services were not interrupted. But it was all beyond our capacity because of the number of patients due to the border opening. And why do you think there was that flood of people coming across the border for health care? I believe people initially came just because there was peace. They were coming to reconnect with their people. Then they started coming to the health center because they complained they did not have any other health stations near them on that side. They also tell us they receive better medical attention here than they do over there. But we are not as busy now as we were back then because the border checkpoint is closed again. Fair clients are coming now, say about five or six per day on average. They have to come the long way around or sneak in if they live close by. Her name is Kibira. She came here from Inda Dashim in Eritrea. She tells me it took her two hours to get here on foot. 
She came to have her child treated. She's been here previously for the same reason, and she says she received good care in the past. There is no discrimination. We have no reasons to treat Eritreans any differently than we do Ethiopians. We provide medical care to anyone, first and foremost, because they are humans. Where they come from is irrelevant. Our job is to make sure they receive good treatment. Away from the health centre, Samrawit told me that they've also noticed a lot of women coming across the border for family planning services and contraceptives. When we ask them, they say the medication they require is not readily available as centres close to them. But secondly, women here can go to health centres at any time and pick up contraceptives. But what they say is that in Eritrea, a woman's spouse has to grant permission. She needs to be accompanied by her husband and they make the collection together. Without his permission, a woman cannot go alone and pick up contraceptives. Many women tell us they prefer to come here so that they can avoid these restrictions. We're almost ready to rejoin Zerai and Zephyr for their son's baptism, but events to mark the end of life have also been impacted by the border situation. One morning in Zalambessa, our guide, BBC Tigrinya's regional reporter, Germay Gebru, was told about a funeral ceremony that was about to take place in the town with a large number of Eritreans in attendance. It happened that a man came from Eritrea for treatment here in Zalambessa, but he died. And then now the funeral ceremony will be in Zalambessa. And he'd come from Eritrea... He's got relatives who've come today now for the funeral? Yeah, and there are a lot of people came from Eritrea. His children also here in the funeral. My father was my life. I really looked up to him. He struggled to raise me, moving from country to country to do so. I have no words to describe him properly. He was kind, humble, loving. You can see that a lot of people attended the funeral. And now there's an outpouring of grief as the coffin arrives at the graveside. Relatives and friends saying a last goodbye and paying their final respects. Alarm at the graveside, it was only men who gathered to see the coffin put in the grave. Here outside the church, this is where the women have gathered to pay their respects. They've made a large circle in front of the building and in the very centre, the women are crouched, they're passing their knees and now turning towards the church, they raise their arms. They say that, please, our God, our Lord, save us. And then they send their message to the St Mary save them. Salam. Salam. Peace is essential, not just in Eritrea, in Ethiopia, but all over the world. Peace means God. There is nothing to express how good peace is. If there was real peace here, even more people would have attended the funeral. But because the border checkpoint is closed, people had to travel via the villages away from the main road. That's even what my sister had to do just to be able to attend the funeral. It's 
5.30 a.m. Still dark. There's a beautiful crescent moon in the sky. It's a clear night, lots of stars. And up on the hill ahead of me, I can see the lights of the church. The baptism ceremony is underway. And I'm going to walk up and see how it's going. We found the priests in the main church where they'd been preparing for the ceremony by singing, praying and chanting for a couple of hours. And then, with the sun rising, they made their way down to a small separate chapel where Zephyr was waiting patiently. I've just stepped outside. They've been singing prayers and reading passages from the Bible. Zephyr is sat at the front of the room on a rolled up mat on the floor close friends and relatives, all women, are lined up around the edge of the room. There's four priests in there, dressed in white and gold, carrying a long incense burner on chains with bells on. The room is filled with smoke and there's a beam of light coming through, just where there's a crack in the window shutters. It's a very sombre but very beautiful moment celebrating a new life and committing this little boy to God. The priest is now picking up the bottle with her holy water and pouring it into the basin, ready for the baptism. The little boy's been brought out of his blankets. He doesn't seem too happy about it. His feet are dipped in the water in the basin and he's held up tight as the main priest cups water from the bottom and pours it over his head. It's quite startling and he's making it known. And now the baptism's done, the priest leads all of the women back up the hill to the main church. We've just reached the top and now that it's light you can really see all around. You can see the main town, Zalambesa, and also you can see Eritrea, the villages, just across a wall that I can see in the distance. That is the border, the churches, the houses, a school, a community which was cut off from this community for such a long time, not able to just walk across to see their friends and family. I can see now between Zalambesa and the nearest Eritrean village is maybe a kilometre at the most. An impassable kilometre has now become passable again for the communities, for the families, for the friends who just want to come to events like this, a baptism, to celebrate a new life, a funeral, to say goodbye to an old friend. It's all possible again now. Well, the baptism ceremony itself was Zephyr's domain. It was for the women only. But Zerai is back at the house preparing for the party afterwards. There's a power cut, it seems, at the moment, so the generator's on. And we've just made a quick beeline so we can be here ahead of the train of women skirting their way down the hill. It's quite a stunning sight. And the church in the distance, right at the top of the, the rocky hill, they've weaved their way down. The music's just piping up, so... The party's getting started. Let's just have a quick word with Zarai before they arrive. How are you feeling? I'm really happy. Today is a special day for me. I am overjoyed beyond words. Zafir and her 
train of women have arrived. They're leading the way into the party. And behind them, there's another long line of people, many of them carrying plates stacked with injera, the large pancake, the staple food here. And their plates are stacked with them and then covered with colourful netting to keep away the flies. And now they've made their way into the compound. There's a marquee over the top. It's quite dark, but the music is pumping. And now women have gathered in a circle and they're dancing round and round in single file, clapping, singing, just to welcome the baby after the baptism. Friends and relatives continued to arrive. More and more food was served and the beer did not stop flowing. With baby Ivanov fast asleep inside the house, Zafir enjoyed chatting with relatives and the occasional visit to the dance floor. Zarai, on the other hand, was rushing around everywhere, making sure things were going to plan. But he called me over to introduce me to one special guest. It's really good. I was expecting a lot of relatives to come and they are here. Some have arrived from Eritrea already and others are on the way. This is my relative who arrived from Masawa in Eritrea. She's my uncle's daughter. She has always been by my side since I got married until now. And here she is today, in my honour, at my son's baptism. The fact that she has been with me from my wedding until now shows you the love, culture and unity. The relationship we have with Eritrea in terms of culture and language shows we are one. So my cousin is here once again by my side. What does it mean to you to be able to come to an event like this, the baptism of a close family member? You've been able to come from Masawa in Eritrea. What does that mean to you? I'm just so very happy. I came here to be happy and to be with my relatives. It's not nice to be far away from your family. To be together and to love one another is good. It gives you peace of mind. And you also came to the wedding last year. All of that was possible because of a peace deal between the two countries. What, what is the big change between now and how things were before there was a peace deal, before the peace? To have peace is better. When there was no peace, we had no news of who was dead and who was alive. You can see that the longing has even affected the way we look. It's terrible to live with longing like that. But now we have learned about our dead and we are happy to be able to meet those who are still alive. It's a massive difference. It's like the difference between the earth and the sky. We left Sarai greeting another group of relatives arriving from one of the villages just on the other side of the border and more came later in the afternoon. But afterwards, Zephyr revealed that they were also affected by the borders in certain states. There were actually fewer Eritreans at the baptism celebrations than we had hoped. We danced and chatted with those who came, but the rest couldn't make it. In comparison, there were a lot of Eritreans at our wedding ceremony, but now because the border checkpoint is closed, they didn't come in quite the numbers we expected. Similar events would have been taking place all along the border that Saturday. Families enjoying the new freedom of movement which has been apparent since September 2018. Lives have undoubtedly changed and crossing the border has gone back to being normal for some. But the political uncertainty is never far from people's lips. I found that in Zalambessa, where there was joy, there was also frustration. Having been shown a glimpse of what the future could look like, it's been put on hold, perhaps indefinitely. And of course, this is only the view from one side of the border. On numerous occasions, we requested permission to visit Eritrea as part of recording this programme, but we were not granted it and told to wait until a new road to the area had been built. Ethiopia and Eritrea, Rebirth at the Border, was produced and presented by me, Rob Wilson. It was mixed by Neil Churchill and the editor was Andrew Smith. 
It's part of the Life Changes series from the BBC. Thank you for listening. There will be more from the documentary podcast soon. The documentary is just one of our BBC World Service podcasts. There are many others to choose from.